the sky above New Delhi, India, two aircraft communicate with the control tower. Same airspace on opposite headings. The probability of their colliding in midair is one in 100 million. But for these aircraft and the 349 people aboard them, that probability is about to be realized. At 6.40 p.m., two aircraft collide in the world's worst mid-air collision in history. Gandhi International Airport, New Delhi, India. November the 12th, 1996. The evening shift started as any other would. 5.30 was a demanding time for the air traffic control tower. The International Departure Terminal 2 was a hub of activity. Passengers slowly filtered in after brief goodbyes from relatives and well-wishers. The evening also started, as any other day would, for VK Dutta, a senior air traffic controller. He was about to finish his regular shift. His responsibility was to guide all incoming traffic to Delhi Airport. On November the 12th, 1996, he was also responsible for all outgoing traffic. At 6.33 p.m., Saudi Airline 763 under the command of Captain Khalid al Shubhaili, co-pilot Nasir Khan and flight engineer Edris takes to the runway. A Boeing 747, Saudi 763, is flying 289 passengers to Dahran, Saudi Arabia. At approximately the same time, flying into Delhi from the former Soviet Republic Kazakhstan is Kazakhstan Airlines 1907. is commanded by Captain Cheripanov and co-pilot Jangirov, who is flying the aircraft. Flight engineer Chuprov, radio operator Rep in charge of all communication, and navigator Arabeyev assist them. Kazakh 1907 is flying 27 passengers to New Delhi. Three minutes after takeoff from Delhi Airport, on board Saudi 763, 16-year-old Sarab and 14-year-old Gaurav are excited. 
Not only is this their first flight, they're going to see their parents after nine long months. That day I had spoken to them in the morning. I spoke to my eldest son. The younger one was sleeping. I thought they are coming today. We'll get to talk a lot. Why wake him up? This was their first flight. They checked in by themselves, did everything on their own. Went through security checks and then boarded the aircraft. It was the first flight. This was the last flight as well. 35-year-old Farah Mumtaz is torn between leaving her daughters in Delhi and visiting her husband in Jeddah. I was the last one to say goodbye. When I hugged her, she told me to behave and not trouble anyone. My mother was leaving for 15 days. We had never stayed away from her for that long. We were crying when she left home. I don't know why, but I felt that this was the last time I was seeing her. Mohammed Tahir, his wife Rihanna, and their eight-month-old son Taimur are finally on their way to Al Jubail near Dahran. A week ago, they had to cancel their ticket. Their son was unwell. The memories are the only thing I have of them. I had a horrific vision the night before they left. In my dreams, I saw a man who told me to hold on to my heart. Two aircraft are in the same airspace on opposite headings. The probability of their colliding head-on in the air is one in 100 million. Yet it happened. Why? Radiological collision accidents can take place due to pilots not adhering to ATC instructions, number one. Number two, air error in the instrument readings. Number three, erroneous instructions by the air traffic controller. Saudi 763 approaching flight level 100 for hire. Roger, climb flight level 140. Roger, climb 140, Saudi 763. VK Data, the air traffic controller, tells Saudi 763 to climb to 14,000 feet. Then approach, good evening. Kanatan 1907. Now passing 230 Kazakh 1907, descend to flight level 150, report reaching. Descend in 150, copy reaching, Kazakhstan 1907. He then instructs Kazakh 1907 to descend to 15,000 feet. Sounds 763 approaching 140 for hire. Roger. Maintain flight level 140, stand by for hire. Sounds 763 will maintain 140. There can be a chain of reasons due to which uh, something like this may happen. One of the main primary reasons is distractions in the cockpit. 1907, report radius, we are VK Data warns Kazakh 1907 about Saudi 763 at 14,000 feet. Identified traffic, 12 o'clock, Karachi broker. Saudi Boeing 747. But to no avail. At 6.40 p.m., the seemingly impossible happens. Saudi 763 and Kazakh 1907 crash in mid-air over New Delhi in the world's worst mid-air collision in history. 349 lives are lost in a split second. actually leaving office when my input editor Suparna Singh said uh, Vishnu there is some news which is coming in which we'd like you to check out news of uh, a possible um, disaster possible air crash we drove out from Delhi we drove into Haryana 
at that stage we didn't have any information about just where the crash had taken place so we just proceeded in a general direction uh, i would say it was about 9 to 9:15 in the evening at this stage we stopped our vehicle immediately and the wreckage was about a kilometer away from me and as one kept walking i realized all around me there were clumps what i thought was um, cow dung and it wasn't too long perhaps just a few seconds when i realized that look maybe these clumps aren't isn't th th these clumps aren't manure at all that perhaps this could be debris or perhaps it could be something else and i immediately told told see my camera person to switch on his camera light please switch on the light and immediately we saw all around us we we, we saw dead bodies all around us within a few moments of actually switching on our camera light we realized that there was no question of any survivors the saudi boeing 747 the uh, kazakh illusion 76 aircraft there was there was no part of the fuselage of the aircraft which was intact everything had been obliterated there were dead bodies all around it was abundantly apparent that there was no one who would survive this when this incident happened i was 7 years old for the next couple of years i kept thinking she'll come back they have gone to get my son he's hurt but he'll be back he'll be back i could only find the passport of my eldest son it took a second for everything to be destroyed there were no survivors 349 lives are lost in a split second in the world's worst mid-air collision in history. Overnight, the small town of Cherki Dadri, where the two aircraft went down, shot from obscurity into the annals of aviation history to be synonymous with death and destruction forever. I found a letter in the crash site. A girl had written to her brother, "Get me a nice dress and a pen when you get back. Come back soon." Villagers who had their dinner before the crash were the only ones who ate that night. With so many dead bodies lying in our village, who could eat? It felt like we had lost our family. Relatives came looking for their people. They asked us to help but how could we identify them? They were beyond recognition. Some of them couldn't speak. Their pain was evident. The full extent of the tragedy was visible from the air. The wreckage of the two aircraft was spread over 7 kilometers. Whatever was left of Saudi 763 was either buried in the ground or lay scattered in tangled heaps of molten metal. And they too told a story. They told the investigators how the Boeing 747 disintegrated in mid-air. 747 had lost its tail plane went out of control spinning violently whereby the wings separated and the four engines fell miles apart Kazakh 1907 had survived in bits and pieces the cockpit shattered but the burnt instrument console was still intact charred remains of its fuselage stood as a lone witness to a startling fact that the aircraft had not disintegrated in mid air so that means that uh, it had the some flyability until uh, very close to the ground but it broke after impact to the on the ground primary investigation of the wreckage suggested two points of impact the 
747, I believe, was fairly straight and level, whereas the Kazakh aircraft is a slightly banked turn and offset slightly, so that the wings contacted each other first, one wing off of the Kazakh aircraft and certainly the tail off of the 747, and that, and that led to the, to the crash. And as far as the altitude of impact was concerned, the only clue was from one of the altimeters of Kazakh 1907, found in the wreckage. It was frozen at 14,895 feet. It could be anything. There are so many evidences which are to be collected and to be compiled and studied, analyzed. And we were mostly interested in now looking for the black boxes, which are the prime evidence material for any aircraft accident. The two black boxes were found the day after. The Indian Court of Inquiry, the investigation agency, sealed the black boxes and sent them for decoding. While Kazakh 1907's black box would be decoded in Moscow, Saudi 763's black box would be decoded in the United Kingdom. But to begin with, the investigation headed not too far from Cherki Dadri to the air traffic control, the ATC. What happened is something which should not have happened has happened. In no ATC in the world would ever like a mid-air coalition action to take place. And it, immediately it is it is felt that it could be a mistake on their part. That would be the normal reaction. The unblinking, watchful eyes that stare at the radar screen day in and day out are human. And sometimes it is human error that results in a potentially disastrous consequence. He might just give you a wrong altitude clear to. There have been various incidences where the ATC controller has given uh, wrong altitude clearance due to which accidents have taken place. When VK Dutta took over his shift on November the 12th, 1996, he brought with him more than 10 years of experience and proficiency as an air traffic controller. Was it possible that he had given incorrect instructions that led to the mid-air collision? The first course of action for the investigators was to replay the ATC tapes. Eight minutes from impact. Saudi 763, after takeoff, contacts VK Dutta. Saudi 763 airborne. Saudi 763, identified on departure. Climb flight level 100 initially, stand by for hire. Initially flight level 100, stand by for hire. Saudi 763. He asks them to climb to flight level. 100 or 10,000 feet. Kazakh 1907 is close to 23,000 feet. Six minutes from impact. Kazakh 1907 at 23,000 feet contacts him. Kazakhstan 1907. Roger, Kazakh 1907. Descend to flight level 150. Report reaching. Descend in 150. Call your agent. Kazakhstan 1907. VK Dutta clears descent to flight level 150 or 15,000 feet. Saudi 763 is close to 10,000 feet. Four minutes from impact. Saudi 763, now at 10,000 feet, contacts him for further ascent. Roger, climb flight level 140. Roger, climb 140, Saudi 763. VK Dutta clears ascent to flight level 140, 14,000 feet. Kazakh 1907 is now at 15,000 feet. One and a half minutes from impact. Saudi 763 asks VK Dutta for further instructions. Approaching 140 for higher. Roger. Maintain flight level 140. Stand by for higher. Saudi 763 will maintain 140. He asks them to maintain 14,000 feet till further notice. Kazakh 1907 is at 15,000 feet. Two aircraft are in the same airspace on opposite headings. Saudi 763 is at 14,000 feet. Kazakh 1907 is at 15,000 feet. 1,000 feet separates them. That's safe enough, according to ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. But shouldn't VK Data warn them of each other? He does. One minute from impact, VK Data warns Kazakh 1907. 
Saudi Boeing 747 of Saudi 763 at 14,000 feet, eight miles in front of them. But he does not warn the Saudi aircraft. The corpsman doesn't say that, but should not take it for granted when two blips are merging that they are vertically separated. Ensure they are well, well, vertically separated by repeat messages. But the fact remains that VK Dutta was a silent spectator to the mid-air collision. Report position. He had told the aircraft to stay at separate altitudes. He was assuming that they would pass each other safely. They had 1,000 feet between them. Because he was thinking probably they were merging and going to reappear in both the sides and waiting for giving a decent, further descent clearance to the incoming aircraft and climb clearance to the Saudi outgoing. It was evident that one of the aircraft or both the aircraft had breached its assigned flight level. By how much and why? Three months after the accident, on a cold February morning in Moscow, the black box of Kazakh 1907 was cut open. The investigators heard the voices of the Kazakh crew for the first time. It was clear from the tape that the air traffic controller instructed the Kazakh crew to stay at 15,000 feet. He also told them to look out for the Saudi aircraft and to report back once they had sighted it. The turning point of the investigation was when the digital flight data recorder that records altitude, speed and other technical parameters was decoded. It ruled out technical malfunction. The altitude of impact could not be calculated with accuracy. It had a huge margin of error. But the graph revealed a startling fact. Kazakh 1907 had descended below 15,000 feet. This was a, a point which we all had in our mind at the time. Why? If a pilot is told to maintain certain level and if he doesn't maintain, there must be some reason for it. You can argue that, that the crew made an error and just descended, but it, it's, it's, it's the puzzling part is building up why, in fact, if they made an error, why they made an error, and, and, and trying to piece that together. The possible answer to that question lay with the sole eyewitness to the mid-air collision, Captain Timothy J. Place of the United States Air Force. He was flying into New Delhi Airport at the same time. He had seen the collision from 20,000 feet. collision happened in the clouds. Is it possible that Kazakh 1907 had descended due to bad weather? It had happened before. On December the 19th, 1973, the Delhi airport is enveloped in a thick fog. Visibility is down to 1,000 meters. A Lufthansa Boeing 707 undershoots the runway and crash lands 1,500 feet short. The Inquiry Commission finds out that the co-pilot who was flying the aircraft did not monitor the descent adequately. 
He was too busy trying to land the aircraft in the sudden haze and thick fog that impaired his visibility. Could the same thing have happened to Kazakh 1907? Could they have been caught in a freak weather condition? Did co-pilot Jangarov not monitor the altitude? Could he have been too busy battling bad weather? The sorts of weather conditions that can cause an aircraft to lose a great deal of altitude are, are things like thunderstorm activity, where you get updrafts and downdrafts in, in the center of a thundercloud. Um, that, that could have caused it, one of them to descend or another to, 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 to climb. But on November the 12th, 1996, the Met Department had not issued a severe weather warning. It was slightly foggy, there were scattered clouds, and that was about it. Most importantly, Kazakh 1907's cockpit voice recorder did not record any intra-cockpit conversation relating to bad weather. Neither did the digital flight data recorder record sudden changes in the aircraft's movements, nor any severe weather condition. There was no sudden descent. Kazakh 1907 had descended gradually. I don't think that the, the actual weather conditions would have, would have caused the Kazakh aircraft to descend at all. It was like a jigsaw puzzle whose pieces just didn't fit. Kazakh 1907 had descended below its assigned 15,000 feet. But the altimeter found in the wreckage was frozen at 14,895 feet. If that's the altitude at which the collision occurred, it meant that even the Saudi aircraft had breached its assigned altitude. It had climbed above 14,000 feet. Now, all the answers lay in the black box of Saudi 763. At the Aircraft Accident Investigation Bureau in Farnborough in the United Kingdom, the black box of Saudi 763 was cut open. The investigators heard the voices of the crew of Saudi 763 for the first time. It was clear from the tapes that the air traffic controller had instructed the Saudi crew to climb to 14,000 feet and stay there until further notice. Saudi 763's digital flight data recorder was analyzed. The altitude of impact was 14,000 feet. The margin of error was plus or minus 120 feet. Saudi 763 did not ascend above 14,000 feet. Kazakh 1907 had descended below 15,000 feet. Why had Kazakh 1907 come down? Why was one of the altimeters in the Kazakh aircraft frozen at 14,895 feet? What could possibly be the explanation for it? What had happened in the cockpit of Kazakh 1907? It has been five years since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The Commonwealth of Independent States are struggling to stabilize their economies amidst a politically volatile environment. Their airlines are no different. Kazakhstan Airlines, the state-owned airline of the country, has a bad safety record. It flies rickety aircraft, sometimes with a cockpit crew not conversant with flying outside the former Soviet Union. There have been numerous crashes and near misses, three in 1995 itself. But as far as Kazakh 1907 is concerned, the Aleutian jet did not have any technical snags, and the crew was well conversant with flying outside the former Soviet Union. In fact, Captain Cherepenov had 708 hours of flight time on international routes. Co-pilot Jangirov, the pilot flying, had 207 hours. Flight engineer Chuprov had 1,178 hours. Radio operator Rep had 645. And navigator Arabeyev had 581 hours of flight time on international routes. How is it possible that a crew with such experience did not level the aircraft at the assigned altitude of 15,000 feet? As far as the IL-76 is concerned, you have to physically level out the aircraft at a particular height and thereafter press the height lock and then maintain the required speed at that particular height. 
it is done by the autopilot itself but by actual physical involvement of the pilot or the co-pilot. But in the cockpit voice recording, there are no call-outs by the co-pilot or the pilot to the flight engineer for more power to maintain speed for a particular altitude, a prerequisite for leveling an aircraft. A one a plain simple explanation could be that it was a controlled flight to a lower level resulting into a collision. A controlled flight. That means that the crew of Kazakh 1907 descended below 15,000 feet with intent. They kept descending because they never knew that their assigned altitude was 15,000 feet. Every accident is an avoidable accident. Every accident could have been an avoidable accident. But for certain failure on the part of a human element. It's as simple and as tragic as that. A one in 100 million possibility became a horrific reality due to human error. 349 lives are lost in a split second because one of the aircraft did not maintain its assigned height. could it all have happened? Every accident, every disaster has a sequence, links in the chain of events, where one mistake leads to another, which finally leads to the catastrophe. In the world's worst mid-air collision, the sequence started eight minutes before impact, at 6.33 p.m. when Saudi 763 takes off. VK Dutta assigns them 10,000 feet. Kazakh 1907 is at about 23,000 feet. Both aircraft are in the same airspace on opposite headings. This should not have happened. This is the first mistake the first link in the chain of events that leads to the disaster. To avoid this, the airspace above Delhi airport should have been unidirectional. There should be two separate air corridors, one for the departing aircraft and the other for arriving aircraft. Then two aircraft on opposite headings would never share the same airspace. But this wasn't the case at Delhi airport. There just wasn't enough room. Part of the airspace is reserved for the Indian Air Force. Why do we have always have to wait for any kind of uh, disaster, a catastrophic disaster? Can't we do it before so many innocent lives are lost? There may be certain constraints which I can understand, but not to, a, not to an extent where we have to wait for a crash or it is something like a time bomb ticking. The time bomb is ticking. Six minutes to impact. Kazakh 1907 contacts VK Data for the first time. He assigns them 15,000 feet. Descent to flight level 150, report reaching. Descent in 150. The radio operator acknowledges the height, but astonishingly does not inform the two pilots. Worse still, the navigator also hears the assigned flight level on his headset. He is heard converting it to meters for the two pilots but neither of them acknowledges the assigned height. This is the second mistake, the second link to disaster. My personal view is, is, is that there was confusion with the pilots about what their cleared altitude was. Um, there may have been some language difficulties. The pilot and co-pilot's knowledge of English is limited. The radio operator is translating all commands from the Delhi air traffic control for them. Pilot flies gets the information, directly makes a lot of difference. The reactions are spontaneous, instantaneous. Two minutes to impact. Kazakh 1907 is gradually descending. 
It's now at about 16,000 feet. Captain Cherepenov, the pilot who is not flying, is supposed to inform the cockpit crew of the estimated time and height to level out. He never does. This is the third link to the disaster. He was the captain of the aircraft, he's the commander of the ship, so he should have known what height to be level out. One and a half minutes to impact. Saudi 763 is told to stay at 14,000 feet till further notice. One minute to impact. At 6.39 p.m., the Kazakh radio operator tells VK Data they are at 15,000 feet. This is another extraordinary error. In reality, they are at 16,300 feet. The altimeter is on the front instrument console. The radio operator may not have seen it. This is the fourth link to the disaster. Seconds before impact, VK Data tells Kazakh 1907 about Saudi 763 in front of them. Kazakh 1907 is already below 15,000 feet. By the time he completes the transmission with the radio operator of Kazakh 1907, the aircraft is at 14,500 feet. Gradually descending, it enters into a cloud layer. Saudi 763, at 14,000 feet, enters the same cloud layer. The first signs of trouble are heard in the Kazakh cockpit. The captain asks for the assigned flight level for the first time. Flight level have you been ordered? Kazakh 1907 is still descending, now at about 14,100 feet. Saudi 763 is at 14,000 feet. Seconds later, the two aircraft are going to crash. Even in these circumstances, with better equipment, the impending collision could have been averted. But SSR, or secondary surveillance radar, that can tell a control of the altitude of an aircraft is not installed in the Delhi air traffic control. The controllers still work on archaic primary radar that can only tell them approximate headings. This means that VK Datta was not aware of Kazakh 1907's unauthorized descent. Saudi 763. The secondary surveillance radar had been in the offing, but mired in bureaucracy, the project lay to one side. There are too many channels to go through, hurdles to cross, so these things take time. The fifth link to the collision is complete. Seven seconds before impact, a tragic sequence of events unfolds in the Kazakh cockpit. The flight engineer realizes that the aircraft has descended below 15,000 feet, their assigned flight level. He probably tries to accelerate to climb, but the captain asks him to hold on and not to accelerate. The flight engineer responds by calling out, holding. Holding. What I feel has happened at that point of time is, that the engineer has realized that the aircraft has gone below 150. He has started opening power, anticipating the next moment I will get a call for climbing or accelerating. But the captain is not yet sure, or maybe he's made a gesture to the uh, flight engineer that hold the power. Kazakh 1907 holds its course. It keeps descending. The pilots of Kazakhstan Airlines 1907 don't know that their assigned altitude is 15,000 feet. What flight level have you been ordered? The air traffic controller can't warn them. He doesn't have secondary surveillance radar. There is a last resort. But neither of the aircraft has TCAS, traffic collision avoidance systems installed. They do not have onboard computers that can warn them of another aircraft directly in front of them and suggest evasive action. That is the last uh, filter for collision avoidance, which is independent of uh, any ground control, any ground radar. It is aircraft to aircraft. 
collision avoidance systems give time which is uh, sufficient in most cases to avoid collisions. But the Civil Aviation Ministry never made TCAS mandatory over Indian airspace by 1996. It took India a mid-air collision to implement these systems. The sixth and the final link to the collision is complete. Two seconds to impact. Saudi 763 is at 14,000 feet. Kazakh 1907 is at about 14,000 feet. The radio operator shouts out a warning. The captain asks for full power. If only he hadn't. Kazakh 1907 would have passed safely below Saudi 763, but it's too late. The flight engineer opens full power on all engines. Kazakh 1907 accelerates to climb to 15,000 feet. There's chaos in the cockpit. Everyone screaming. They have just seen Saudi 763 coming towards them. At 6.40 p.m., 14,000 feet over Cherki Dadri, the left wing of Kazakh 1907 crashes into the two left engines of Saudi 763. Saudi 763 catches fire instantaneously. It goes into a nosedive. Spinning violently, Saudi 763 disintegrates in midair. The last recording in the Saudi cockpit is a prayer. <laughs> Kazakh 1907 keeps climbing. The altimeter, later found in the wreckage, freezes at 14,895 feet. The aircraft reaches 15,856 feet and then falls down to earth. Three hundred and forty nine souls, three hundred and forty nine dreams, and three hundred and forty nine hopes are extinguished in a split second. Today, the words, if only, are the only words that echo in the minds of many. Ten years later, Kazakhstan Airlines has stopped operating. English is now a primary qualification for pilots from the Commonwealth of Independent States consisting of former Soviet republics. The Indian airspace is now unidirectional. All aircraft flying into it have TCAS and the Delhi airport has secondary surveillance radar. This disaster served as a precursor to lots of improvements, but at what cost? Isn't my daughter-in-law beautiful? My son was also good. He used to say, I'll take care of my mother. She took care of all of us, all our lives. Gave us a good education. Brought all of us up. He used to say very nice things. I dream of him. Every time he says I'll come back, I keep asking him, when? It is very difficult in life to lose young children. I only have their memories now. Even though it hurts me a lot, I definitely want to keep these memories. I planned so many things for myself, for my life. Everything finished in one second. I remember having her around always, working in the same room where I would be, playing or doing my stuff. That's all I remember. I was very young. I miss my mother the most when I see other mothers with their daughters. 